Thank you so much. Uh, I guess all of you have some idea of what Pydantic Logfire is, so I'm going to do a bit uh, of explaining the, the principle, and then I'm going to do some example of uh, instrumenting an app live. That may go well, that may go badly. Uh, we will see. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, we can take some Q&A here, but also we're at the booth. Uh, so if you have like more detailed questions or if your question, we don't have time, uh, obviously time to, time to answer them at the booth. Um, so what is a log? In, here in like Python nomenclature, it is effectively uh, a 1D list of three things, generally three things, not even all of these in some cases. A timestamp, when it happened, a level, often that's not available, but generally it is, and, and a string. It is, if you were to write it out as Python code, it would look something like this. Now, this is all very well, but it has enormous limitations in terms of trying to work out what's happened. So if we look at this particular example and we see, for example, this error happened here, which request is it associated with? Basically impossible to know. There is no link between this log message here and the, the my laser's not working, um, and the, the request that caused it. That's, one of, that's the, only the beginning of the problem with logs. There's also no hierarchy, really. Sure, there's a level, which tells you that the error might be more interesting than the warning uh, or the info, but you probably want the info to get the context on the error, so you can't just look at the error. So uh, the point is here that this is really what code looked like in about the 80s. Even Fortran 77, which is, predates the, uh, the 80s, had, um, like, had subroutines, right? Even in the 1980s, we could do it some degree of putting our code into blocks and therefore making it easier to understand, both for the person writing it and for, uh, for those reading it later. So what should it look like? What about this structure for a log? So we still have a start timestamp, but we also have the end timestamp in the event, in the case that it was, a, that it was some kind of um, routine that took some amount of time. We have the message, same, same as before. We have attributes. We might well want to send through more data than fits into a single line of, of a log output. And then, most importantly of all, we have children. And that gives us, effectively, a tree view of, of logs, rather than just this linear list. This is a far more powerful model through which to think about what it is to observe an application than the linear list of logs that we're all used to. Now, some of you will be coming from having used existing observability platforms and will be like, this is all new, none of this is new, why are you even talking about this? That is true, but for most Python developers, for most of us, most of the time until now, logging is basically the default. Getting the other things of, is expensive in terms of cost, but most of all it's expensive in terms of faff, in terms of the like, mental overhead of trying to configure it. And so for most Python developers up until now, logging has been what we've been stuck with. Um, so, uh, like I say, the, the, the innovation here in Logfire is not that, what we, that this idea is completely new, but trying to make it as easy as possible for everyone to use, so, yeah, so everyone can, can, get, can, can get it. So what is Pydantic Logfire? Um, or what are the advantages of it? The first and most important one is it is simple to get started with. It is founded on the same principle as Pydantic that even the most powerful tools can be easy to use. I am totally convinced that there are lots of software engineers, less so now, but definitely in the past, who tried to prove how clever they were by making things with complex APIs. And I think that like, the one reason, really, that Pydantic is successful is that we, it does the opposite. To the point of like, breaking the rules of how you should do things to make it easy to use. And we wanted to do the same thing with Logfire. We wanted you to be able to understand it without having to go and spend days reading about the definition of observability what a trace provider is, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's built on top of OpenTelemetry. That means we get enormous amounts of stuff for free. OpenTelemetry is an open standard for observability. Started uh, three or four years ago, but just kind of coming to maturity now. Um, lots of people are building on top of it, but it has, its API looks very much like someone has tried to prove how clever they are by defining it. Actually, what happened was they made a decision that every programming language should have the same API which means they have to use effectively the like, lowest common denominator of things that are available in all languages, so they couldn't go and build the nice abstractions that you would want. For example, you can't do a context manager because they're not available in JavaScript or in Rust or in really any other language like they are in Python. Um, 
So we went and took OpenTelemetry, we built on top of it, we uh, effectively yeah, built some things on top of it that make, it that make Logfire particularly easy to use in Python. But of course, because we're just OpenTelemetry, you can use Logfire with any language. So you can send data to our platform from, from any language. You have the same shitty user experience setting it up in your app that you would have if you were using OpenTelemetry uh, with anyone else. But we'll get to other languages in time. Um, because again, we're open telemetry, we have traces as logs, as I'll show you in a minute, and we have, and we have metrics. Um, we have auto tracing, which is, I won't demonstrate today because it's uh, a bit trickier to set up, but it effectively allows us to insert a span around every function call, and so you get something broadly akin to tracing, but within your application. But we, it, it will be clever enough not to instrument function calls that are very, very fast. So you get, uh, you have a basic threshold, and above that we'll, we'll log it. And lastly, we have structured data. So I was saying earlier that we had attributes that was a, that was a dictionary that contained more, 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 de <coughs> more details. One of the limitations of OpenTelemetry is that the attributes, effectively the extra information you can send with each event, are really primitives. They're really just strings and uh, homogeneous lists of integers, effectively. So we do a bunch of work on top of that. Effectively, we JSON encode uh, Python objects, and then we send metadata about that JSON so that we can reconstruct something that looks like a repro. Um, so this is the Logfire dashboard, as I guess you will all have seen on the booth. But I'll, I'll just like pull out the three things that make it particularly different. So this, we call it uh, nested logging. Of course, this is really trace data. So this is, as I showed you at the beginning, not just events, but also in, in most cases, their duration or the duration of different tasks uh, nested effectively within a top level event, like a, in this case, an HTTP request. Secondly, in the Logfire platform, we allow you to search all your data with SQL. So whether that be filtering on this live view, exploring your data in the Explore tab, building dashboards based on SQL, or indeed setting up alerts, again, defined by SQL. We think it is, SQL is a very powerful way of effectively putting the complexity in a standard tool that lots of you will have already used. And the bumper is that OpenAI or generative AI is very, very good at generating SQL. So if you don't want to have to go and write the SQL, you can get OpenAI to do it for you. So if you want logs from yesterday between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. that were error or above, you don't need to work out the SQL. You can use natural language querying to write that out and, and get the result. And then lastly, there's the structured data. So here we're showing, uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but we have a Pydantic model. This, this particular piece of, uh, this particular um, item that we're showing the details of is the auto-instrumentation of Pydantic. So we have, you can't see it all here, but we have the raw input data. We have the status of that validation, which was successful. And then we have the result, which is a, here a Pydantic model. So again, because we're sending the metadata, we can get the name in the model and we can show that here. And obviously we have all of its members and again, you can go and query on that data. It's stored in a structured, uh, structured form, and you can go and query on it, where I don't think other tools generally make that possible. Um, so I'm going to go on now and give, if I can find a way out of this, I'm going to do some do a demo of using Logfire. So what I have here, if it's going to work, uh, is a very simple fast API app, which uh, is called Cat Bacon, and it will generate an image of whatever animal you give it in the style of Francis Bacon. So if we give it the most obvious option of a cat, and we let it go and run, this is, by the way, using fast UI that I talked about earlier, um, but obviously there's nothing special about fast UI when it comes to, to Logfire. We go and we get back, and we get this image of a cat, and of course we can go and do something slightly more fun than a cat, like for example, a llama. Is that, I don't know how, oh, it'll do the job. <laughs> and uh, the problem is here, right, we have no instrumentation, so, oh. <laughs> um, all we have in terms of what happened is the standard, uh, screen that we get from, I don't know whether you can see that, but maybe I can zoom in. Uh, uh, what was the... We just get the standard log that we get given by UVicon. 
not very helpful. In particular, we don't know where that slowness came from when we were waiting for the, our picture of a llama to load. Uh, and we could go and look at some other things. So we have a list of the previous images that were load that, that, have, been, that have been run. And this endpoint seems like kind of slow, given that, like, in theory, it's running locally on the local Postgres database on my incredibly expensive Mac. It should be instant. What's going on to make that slow? So let's take this app and try and instrument it with FastAPI to get an idea, sorry, with, with Logfire, to get an idea uh, of what it can do. So this is the, the code for the app here. Hopefully, some of you can see that. If you can't, I have not yet, but I will immediately after this upload it onto the repo that I uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, so this is where our, our app starts effectively. This is where we have the fast API declaration of the app. And we're going to come, and first thing we're going to do is set up. I'm going to make it bigger again. First thing we're going to do is set up a project with Logfire. So the Logfire uh, Python package is both uh, a package you install and has a CLI. So if I run Logfire, who am I? I should get that I'm logged in as Samuel Colvin, and there's no Logfire credentials set up for this directory. So if I do uh, Logfire projects new, I get asked what organization I want it to be attached to, defaulting to my own organization, fine. I'm going to call the project talk, which is good enough for now. And our project is, has been, gone and been created. And now, if I run Logfire, who am I? Not only does it know I'm logged in as me, but it knows what project I'm linked to. And that's just from uh, a .logfire directory that gets created uh, in your local directory. Uh, we have slightly different instructions if you're using Logfire in production, where you set an environment variable. But this is very useful for development. So if we open this, we get well, first of all, we get instructions on what to do next, but we know what we're doing. So we can then see the Logfire UI. Nothing here yet, because we haven't logged any data. So let's go and instrument our app with Logfire. So we're going to start by importing Logfire. We're going to Logfire configure. We don't need to set anything here. There's a whole bunch of keyword arguments you can use to configure how Logfire works. None of them do we need at this particular time, but we're also going to we're going to instrument our fast API app. So that's just logfire.instrument fast API app. Thank you. I'll also I know I'm using async pg, so I'll instrument that logfire.instrument async pg. And we're also obviously using OpenAI, so I'll go and instrument the OpenAI client. So if I do this. And I happen to know the instrument fast API, uh, log, uh, log, uh, OpenAI takes the client as an argument. So I'll do uh, instrument OpenAI. Thank you. And so that's the, I guess, the main bits of our app. You'll see we've added one, two, sure we reconfigured that there, three, four, five lines of code so far to our app. And now if we run it again, you will see that we start seeing some different logs come out here. But more importantly, if we go and look at our application, we start seeing, first of all, we see some, some uh, SQL queries coming through and how long they're taking. But probably more interesting is to come and look at our app and look at, say, we've got list of, our list of uh, images. And if we come back in here, you will see the uh, log file statements associated with those requests that I just ran. So for example, this was me. Actually, I won't talk about that one because it's got Something exciting to show you in a minute, but if I get the, um, the the API endpoint, you'll see I can see the fast API arguments. Nothing very exciting in here. Um, if I generate an image of an animal, I'm dyslexic, so I need the name of an animal that's easy to spell, please. No. Okay, we'll do dog. Thank you for that. Uh, and while that's running, we can come over here, and you can see that request to generate the image ongoing right now. And we can literally see what's happening in this case. Ah, and it's finished. And we have a picture of. Sorry? Uh, I'll, I'll t oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, dog. There's not much more interest. <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm very sorry. That was not intentionally quite as unhelpful as it was meant to be. 
Um, so is that a bit easier to see? Um, but you can see here we have the request to generate. We can see uh, that it took 9.3 seconds. And we can see that the, the, the events that went on within it, not particularly interesting, we spend 9.3 seconds of that uh, making the API request to OpenAI. Um, and you can see here that a bit of information about what happened, the prompt that was actually used to make the request. We don't uh, obviously show the data from the image in this particular case uh, in Logfire, although that, we can do that. And then you'll see the uh, database request to, um, to store that data in the images table. And you'll see how long that took, although in this particular request, it's not very interesting. From the point of view of Logfire, what gets more interesting is if we come over here and we look at the list of images. And you see I, that's kind of weirdly slow for happening locally. So let's look and work out why that request is slow. So we can open up our images endpoint, and we can see, whoa, we're doing loads of queries. And so the first one, which is really quick, this is weird. So the first one is getting ID for all of the images filtered by, uh, sorted by timestamp. Uh, and then we're going through each of them and like getting the data for each of them, I guess, which is weird. Now, if you look at the code, it looks obviously contrived because I'm using actual SQL, so it's not easy to do the, make the n plus one mistake. But if I was using an ORM, it'd be very easy to forget to do a select related or do an only, and then we would be, our ORM would be going and making lots of requests to get extra attributes about um, a given model. So you can see here that our code is actually far from ideal. We're getting just the IDs, and then we're iterating over all of the, the rows we want to return and getting the extra attributes. So let's replace that with, uh, let's do this. Oh, we want that line still. We're going to call that rows, and we're going to select star. And uh, UVicorn has happily reloaded. Now if I go back over here and I reload this endpoint, mm, it still seems to be weirdly slow. But if I look at the bottom here, at my request, you will see, sure enough, we're only doing uh, this query here is very fast, and we're only doing that one query. Um, I was about to show you another, like, oh, this is still slow. But I have, what I've realized is I forgot to remove the index that I was about to be like, so you should add an index. But I've forgotten to delete the index. So bear with me while I go and delete the index and then pretend I haven't deleted the index. Uh, if I go and log into the database, you will see we have this here. That, is that showing? Maybe there is no index on it. That's weird. Well, um, the main thing you can see here is that like, we've gone down to just making the one request, and we can see what's taking what time. And we can see that uh, the, the count of images is still taking 200 milliseconds. Why is that? Well, it's because if I come out of here and we run the server again, you'll see what's weird about this is we don't just have those few images I've generated when testing and when showing it to you, but we have loads of randomly generated images. So well, let's look at where that's happening. And let's try and basically instrument some of our code uh, in the database to, or in our database interactions to make it easier to, to like group. For example, you'll see here when we're booting up our app, we have uh, a bunch of SQL queries going on that are happening as like top level events within our log. We'd like to like uh, group them into like, uh, for example, startup. So what we can go and do is we can look for, like, where is that happening? Here we've got this database prepare statement. Let's just put logfire.instrument around that. We need to import logfire in this directory. And you see here we're not having to do anything fancy that, that fancy to, to edit our code. We're just inserting a decorator. And now when we start up our app, you will see immediately that we have DB prepare, and we can see, we can even see the arguments that were passed to it, and then we can we have all of our SQL queries within it nested, and what was taking what time. Um, I don't know how long we've taken. We're probably on about the right time. Gosh, that's amazing. 
so thank you very much. That was my demo. I can show you more stuff uh, later on, but thank you. You're even five minutes too early, Ray. Oh, my gosh. Well, if anyone has any questions, happy to, happy yeah, to take them. Yeah, we are them. now in Q&A session, so go to the microphones and ask your questions. Please feel free. Hi, again. Uh, can you use other collectors than uh, Wagfire? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can send data to, to, open tele to, to Logfire from any a standard open telemetry integration in Python or in another language, so I don't okay. know. Is there any limitation to that? Uh, so I can show you, for example, we have a database internally that we're working on migrating to for, for Logfire, and that is itself instrumented with, uh, with Logfire, which has its own weirdnesses, you might imagine. But if I go back, this is, the, this is the, not the production one. This is my local testing, so I need to go back a few days to show some data, and I'm hoping we will see I don't know how much data there is in this app, but you'll see this data here. You'll see that the scope name is OpenTelemetry OTLP, which is, which is Rust. And you'll see that like, the data is not quite as pretty inside. Uh, that's weird. Um, the, the data on these attributes is not quite as pretty because it's coming from the Rust OpenTelemetry integration with the tracing library in Rust. And it doesn't, so for example, these numeric values are encoded as strings. So we don't get all the prettiness, but you still get to see within this particular write what took what time. Um, the, the limitations are you need to use, you need to use the protobuf version of um, OTEL and you need to use gRPC, not whatever the other one is. I think in time we'll support all of the different protocols and uh, encoding formats, but yeah. And similarly, if you really want, you can send data from the Logfire SDK to another open telemetry sync. So if you, for some reason, don't want to use our platform, you can send that data to something else. It'll look uglier, and we think that the Logfire platform is best, but like, you can do it, because it's just OTEL. And that's obviously the insulation from us being a startup, is that in the end, you could just use Logfire, the SDK, and you would get a better experience uh, observing code in Python than you would with the, uh, the, the default open telemetry SDK, but you can send the data somewhere else. But we just hope that like our platform is good enough, you'll end up using it. Sorry. And there's another question on Discord. So what is the key selling point versus using regular OTEL instrumentation? For example, Kibana or Jaeger or something else? Uh, so there's a number of different things that like standard library, standard OTEL can't do that we can only do because we are controlling both the SDK and the, it could have been a planted question for all the things I forgot to say. Um, so you will see here where we were, I don't know if we have a good example in this particular case, but like maybe we don't and I can show you one here, but like I can go and I'm gonna add another logfire call here, logfire.info. This is like manual tracing that I didn't really like bother to show you before because mostly it's not necessary, but I'm gonna say like X and I can do, well, let me define X here. Gone, yeah. And then I will turn that into an F string. And you think that using an F string is obviously the worst possible idea in this case, but if you look at where that has just run, you will see not only do we have that statement printed, but we've also been able to extract the argument from the F string and display it. And that's displayed prettily as, a, as in this case, a dictionary, but if it was a data class or a Pydantic model or whatever else, we can show it in a pretty way. None of that is possible if you're using standard OTEL. The other big difference is, as I showed you it here, if I come back and I put in like fish, another nice easy spelling, and you, you'll see here this request going on. We are, only, we are able to show requests while they're in progress. You wouldn't get that with standard OTEL because they only send event information about spans and traces when they finish. That doesn't matter if your span or trace is taking uh, like 300 milliseconds, but it does matter when it's gonna take 40 minutes and you can't see anything until it's finished. And that's because we control the SDK and we basically to an extent, and it's obviously configurable to switch off, hack hotel to send information about traces when they start as well. This one failed for some reason, and I wonder if we can get the trace back. It'd be nice if we did get the trace back, but we don't seem to be getting the trace back on why that was happening. Oh, here we are. Oh, yeah. For some reason, the word fish caused OpenAI to think that we were doing something illegal. But. <laughs> So it does a weird thing where when you generate images, it takes your prompt and then it gives it to normal GPT and says, give loads more context to this. And that loads more context 
sometimes I presume generate something obscene that the second that then is considered invalid. Anyway. So there's another question. Uh, hi. So, so in a way to respond to the previous question, but also to, to you uh, with a question, uh, because I don't think actually Jaeger and, and um, ELK can, is a competition to that, but I mostly already get it from Sentry, uh, also like uh, there is the gay or even open telemetry, uh, breadcrumbs automatically collected, so why uh, use your product instead of Sentry? I mean, I'm a big fan of Sentry, and I, I personally think that the greatest form of flattery, or the greatest, is, is that they've suddenly announced tracing a month after we went into open beta. So <laughs> the reason I had until about three weeks ago was because they don't do tracing. Uh, they don't have any view like this and, uh, whatsoever, and this, this model of, like, it feels like logging, but it's actually tracing, I find incredibly valuable, and the feedback from people has been that it's really useful. The other thing that they don't do, and as from what they've said they are, like, diametrically opposed to, is letting you query the data with SQL. I mean, mm. it's hard. I would say just like go and try and use Sentry for this kind of experience of working out what happened live in your app. And I've, I've never found it as useful for this. It's great for exception handling. I don't find it as useful for other things. But it's a great company, very impressive, no criticism. Um, I don't yet have any uh, experience with open telemetry, although I can see a use case for, for the business where I'm working now where we have a lot of, um, actually, Raspberry Pis running, controlling a factory. Um, how, what, how well can it handle that the network goes down and back up? Yeah, so what the Logfire SDK will do, which, again, is above and beyond standard OTEL, is we store data in protobuf files locally when requests fail, and then we retry them sometime later when we hope the network is back up. We have to be a bit careful about not doing that in a stampede in a way that could cause stampedes, but we, we try very hard to basically store that data locally and yeah, um, up, like send it again when your network is back up. And that obviously is also some insulation. So, so the first thing is the OTEL uh, standard SDK will like retry up to kind of like, I, I don't know how many times, but over like 30 seconds. If it still failed after that, we store it to disk and then we try and pick that file up and resend it later. Great. So, are there any questions still in the room? Because we don't have any on Discord. Ah, uh, nobody's raising his hand. Okay. So, thank you very much, Samuel. I'm really always impressed about live coding, and I think he has a cookie deserved. Here's the thank cookie. you very much. Good.